can we do with this idea? Well, I'll tell you what you can do with this idea. Let's go back to, to, to physics. And remember, I said that the, the best theory is the simplest theory. The best theory for a, the best physical theory is the smallest program that calculates exactly bit for bit your experimental data. So what if you want to prove that you have the best th theory? Okay, so, so if you want to prove that you have the best theory, the simplest possible theory that explains the, 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 the the particular data that you're interested in, that will be the smallest program, the most concise program, the program with the smallest number of bits that exactly calculates your experimental data, bit by bit. And that would be the, the best theory, you know, so the simplest theory. So what if you, if you have a candidate for such a theory and you'd like to prove that in fact you'd have the simplest theory? So to generalize this problem, I'll just forget about the fact that I'm dealing with physical theories. That was the original inspiration. And I'll just define something called an elegant program. And the idea of an elegant program is it's a program is elegant if no smaller program written in the same language produces the same output. Okay, so an elegant program is the simplest possible theory for its output. Okay? A program is elegant. Let me repeat that. You have a fixed computer programming language general purpose programming language, and a program is elegant if no smaller program written in the same language calculates exactly the same results, the same output. So that is, using this model of the scientific method, that would be the simplest theory for, the out, for its output. Okay, the program would be elegant. And there may be several elegant programs that calculate exactly the same thing. You can have a top. So what happens if I want to prove that a program is elegant? So now this sounds a little less connected to theoretical physics or, or metaphysics or the philosophy of physics, but the inspiration is from physics. That's why I think this concept is of interest, the concept of an elegant program. Every best possible theory is an elegant program. And in a sense, they're, they're connected. Here you're not, you're looking at, right, okay, well anyway. So what if I want to prove that a program is elegant? What if I want to use a formal axiomatic theory to prove that a program is elegant? Can I do it? And the surprising answer is that uh, almost never. You can actually prove that you can't prove that a program is elegant. You know, you can prove that you can't prove that you have the best theory. So, so how do we do that? So this is the, so this is the main, uh, how do you say, the main impact. This is the bang for your buck that you get with these ideas, I think this very strong example of a place where mathematical reasoning is in trouble. So let me prove to you that you can't prove that a program is elegant in general. So let's assume that you can, and I'll show you you get into bad trouble. Okay, so, so, so here I'm going to... Let's consider a paradoxical program So we are thinking of a particular formal axiomatic theory, um, and we're interested in knowing, is it, we're, let's assume that it can prove that programs are elegant, individual programs are elegant, um, and we're going to get a contradiction. And I'm assuming that this theory is, uh, doesn't enable you to prove that a program is elegant if, in fact, it's not elegant. So I'm just interested in, in studying a formal axiomatic theory. So here's our formal axiomatic theory that has a certain number of bits in size, a certain complexity, program size complexity, a certain algorithmic information content, a conceptual complexity, and le let's assume that, it's c that it can always prove that a individual programs are elegant when they in fact are, and let's see that this gets us into a contradiction. So here's how it goes. You consider this paradoxical program P, and what it does is it produces as its output <coughs> I'm going to explain this and I say it and then I'm going to explain it OK, 
Okay, so let me say this in words and then explain it. Okay, so let's consider this paradoxical program P that produces the same output as the first provably elegant program Q, which has a larger number of bits than the number of bits in me, this program P. Okay? So this program knows its own size in bits, this program P, and it's, it's running through all possible proofs in this formal axiomatic theory, uh, looking for proofs that individual programs are elegant. And as soon as it finds a provably elegant program Q, which is larger in size than it, P is, it stops and it starts running that provably elegant program Q, and P produces its output, the same output as Q. This is what the calculation that P does. So P is producing the same output as the first provably elegant program that is larger than it is. Now this contradicts the definition of an elegant program, because an elegant program is one that you're not supposed to be able to calculate it from the same output from a smaller program. So, so one way out of this would be, well, if I'm proving false theorems in the particular formal axiomatic theory, whose proofs, all of whose proofs I'm running through. But if you assume that the, that the mathematical theory you're dealing with only enables you to prove that an individual program Q is elegant, when in fact this is the case, then, then you're in trouble. So the way, the way you get out of trouble um, is this program P will never find Q. Uh, this program P will actually never finish and will never actually calculate anything because there is no provably elegant program Q in your formal axiomatic theory whose size and bits is greater than the size and bits of this program. The size and bits of this program is an absolute barrier to proving that individual programs are elegant. So now the question is how big is the size and bits of this program Q? That's the, this, this uh, limit on how big a program can be if we're going to have any hope of being able to prove that it's elegant. So, so it can't be bigger than this program P in bits. So how big is this program? Well, basically, the size in bits of P is just equal to the number of bits in your formal axiomatic theory, which, remember, is just, for me, a program for running through all possible proofs, filtering out the bad ones, and producing all possible theorems. So this is, the, this is a big subroutine of this program. When I say the first provably elegant program in this formal axiomatic theory, that's the number of bits it takes for that part. And then there's a small main program with a fixed number of bits, which is doing what I described here. It's, it's using this subroutine to produce more and more, look for more and more, look through more and more proofs, find more and more provably elegant programs until it finds one that is provably elegant and sufficiently big, bigger than it is. So it's never going to find it. So if, 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 so this is the, so you can never prove that a program is elegant in a formal axiomatic theory if its size in bits is greater than or equal to, is greater than this, is greater than the size of this program, uh, whose size is basically just the number of bits it takes you to, for your software model of the mathematical theory. So in other words, if a mathematical theory can be described in n bits, and you have a program that has more than n bits, it's hopeless to, to prove that that program is elegant. You can only prove that finitely many programs are elegant in any mathematical theory, and basically they're only programs with a smaller number of bits, the number of bits it takes you to have a software implementation of that mathematical theory. Is, that this, a, is this a self-referential statement? It's less self-referential, that's a good question. It's less self-referential than Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Gödel has a, Gödel's proof is I am unprovable. Here, I don't need to know myself. Program P doesn't know itself as intimately as Gödel's self-referential self -referential statement. It only needs to know its own size in bits. So technically, this is an easier proof mathematically because it's very easy to have a program know its own size. It's a little tougher, but Gödel shows us how to do it, to have a program that knows itself. You see, so this is self-referential, but it's a... Uh, it's an easier, so it's a milder form of self-reference than the, than the version in, in, in Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which says I'm unprovable, basically. It's a mathematical assertion which says of itself that it's not provable. So therefore, it's provable if and only if it's not provable. Uh, it's true if and only if it's unprovable. That's the Gödel's original proof. 
he constructs a statement which says of itself that it's unprovable, so it's self-referential, and since it states of itself that it's unprovable, if it's provable, you're proving something false, and if it's unprovable, you have a hole in the power of your mathematical theory because there's something that's true that you can't prove. So this is basically the original proof of Gettys and Peterson. This proof is a little different in personality. Uh, it involves this notion of uh, program size, of measuring conceptual complexity by the size and bits of an algorithm, of a computer program. And also here, you have a situation where you have an infinite number of mathematical truths because there are infinitely many elegant programs, there are infinitely many simplest possible theories, but you can only prove it in finitely many cases, basically only for very small uh, theories, very simple theories or very small programs, which cannot be bigger, their size in bits can't be bigger than the number of bits it takes you to, to run through all possible proofs and filter out the correct proofs and get all the theorems. So, this, so in other words, this, this, in, this information theoretic viewpoint using this notion of algorithmic information gives you a new perspective on Gödel and Kompetis. It's sort of like this. It's the, the, the perspective you get here is that mathematical truth has infinite complexity, but any finite mathematical theory only has a finite number of bits of complexity. Therefore, it's sort of natural that